Hi, I'm Jared Diamond. I'm the author of books about comparative history, and my latest book, Upheaval, is about national political crises, revolutions, invasions, threatened invasions, changes in national identity, viewed in the light of personal crises, breakdowns of relationships, deaths of loved ones, which force us to rethink ourselves personally, but nations also have to rethink themselves personally to undertake selective change. And so my new book looks at upheavals, national political crises in the light of personal crises. My own country, the United States, is undergoing a crisis at the moment, whether or not all Americans recognize it. Um, our crisis is related to things such as restrictions on voting by Americans who wish to vote, the failure of Americans who are entitled to vote to bother to vote, the decline in socioeconomic equality and mobility in the United States, the decline of American government investment in the public good. What can we learn from other countries? Well, we Americans have this delusion called American exceptionalism. We think that the United States is so unique, so unlike any other country, that there's nothing that we can learn from any other country, which is utter nonsense because other first world democracies like Canada and Britain and Germany and Western European countries, all of these Western democracies face similar problems of how to organize our system of health care, how to organize our system of higher education, what to do about prisons, how to balance community interests against individual interests. All of these issues in the United States are currently a matter of dissatisfaction. Most Americans would say that we're not solving well our issues of health care and higher education. But we have this neighbor, Canada, and we have these distant allies in Western Europe that objectively are doing much better with health care and with voter registration than are the United States. It would behoove us Americans to learn from how Canada and Britain and Germany and Italy solve these issues of health care and voter registration because we are making a mess of them and many or most of us recognize that we're making a mess of them, despite which we will not learn from Canada and Western Europe. It's amazing. The UK has experienced and is experiencing upheaval. To begin with how the UK experienced upheaval, I first came to the UK in 1950, five years after the world, end of World War II, when there was still food rationing and there were, when there were lots of bombed out lots in London that had not been reconstructed. Between 1958 and 1962, I lived in the UK when you were undergoing upheaval. The upheavals included then the recent Suez crisis of 1956 that symbolized the loss of Britain's ability to impose its will upon the world, Britain's first race riots in 1958, the change in Britain's position vis-a-vis -vis the world, the falling away of the empire, the increase in Britain's trade relationships with Europe, and the decline of Britain's trade relationships with the Commonwealth. So that was your upheaval immediately after World War II. But I don't have to tell you that Britain is also undergoing an upheaval now with Brexit. Will you or will you not, as of the moment that I speak now, as of 4.53 p.m. on this particular afternoon. Um, Britain has not stepped out of the EU, but we will see tomorrow and the day after tomorrow whether Britain does step out of the EU, and if so, under what conditions. That means a change would mean a change in Britain's identity. It would mean Britain declaring that it's no longer a distinctive outpost of Europe, but it is a separate country with its own trade policies and its own immigration policies and it's completely different set of political institutions, no longer part of Europe. We shall see what you decide, but Britain is undergoing upheaval now, whose outcome is at this moment, 4.53 p.m. on this particular day, unknown to me. What can nations learn from the way that individuals experience trauma? All of us as individuals, all of us have been through personal crises associated with 
breakups or threatened breakups of relationships or deaths or setbacks to a, to a health. So all of us know that, that it helps us get through a crisis if you acknowledge that you're in difficulty. If you don't acknowledge you're in difficulty, you'll get nowhere with resolving the crisis. It's important if you undergo a personal crisis to acknowledge that you have personal responsibility, that you're not a helpless victim. Well, nations too, if a nation enters a crisis, is going to get nowhere solving it if the nation doesn't admit that it's in a crisis now. The United States, for example, is struggling with precipitating into a crisis today, and Americans are divided about whether or not to admit that we are in a crisis. Other features are that people in a crisis may get help or may fail to get help from other people. People in a crisis may use how other people deal with the same problem as a model of how you yourself can deal with that problem. But nations, again, can get help from other countries, from their allies, or they may get no help from their allies. And nations may use other nations as models of how other countries solve that problem. Or nations like the United States often does today may, may refuse to look at other nations as models. So those are some examples of how there are parallels between individuals dealing with personal crises and nations dealing with national crises. Of course, there are differences. Nations have leaders. Individuals don't have leaders. Nations have to re reconcile the interests of different groups. One person doesn't have to reconcile the interests of different parts of the same person. So there are differences between national crises and personal crises, but nevertheless there's a lot that we can learn from personal crises about national crises. My current book, Upheaval, um, is the latest in a series of books that I've written for a broad public over the last nearly 30 years, beginning with my book, The Third Chimpanzee, about human evolution from animal ancestors, which I published in 1991. Then my book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, about the broad pattern of history for the last 10,000 years. My book, Why is Sex Fun? No, the title is not Why Sex is Fun. After 165 pages, I confessed I didn't know the answer. So the title is Why is Sex Fun? Question mark about the evolution of human sexuality. My book Collapse, about why in the past societies have collapsed, especially from environmental problems. And then my book The World Until Yesterday, about what we can learn from tribal societies. All of these books are books of comparative history. I don't publish a book just on one country or one part of one country. You will never see a book by Jared Diamond about the United Kingdom alone. You will see books by me comparing the United Kingdom with other countries. So I am, my approach to history is as a comparative historian. I'm always comparing history because when you compare countries, that raises questions that would never occur to you if you looked at just a single country. And when you can compare countries, you see answers that you would not get if you study just a single country. As a result, there are historians who say, a historian who writes a book just about a single country ends up understanding no country. That's because of what you can learn from comparisons. And so my approach to history is comparisons. My latest book, Upheaval, compares national political crises in about nine countries, the countries where I've lived, speak the language, and that I know best.